All right, in the scripture which was just read, thank you, Judy, the Apostle Paul is writing to the people at Corinth to encourage them to stay strong in the faith. Paul begins the passage by telling the Corinthians that he and they have the same spirit of faith, and that spirit, that very same spirit, moves them to witness. We also believe, and so we speak. Paul then tells them that the Spirit moves them to speak of Jesus, who uh, showed the power of God by being raised from the dead. And the apostle goes on to say that God, who raised Jesus from the dead, will also raise them up to new life so that they will be with Jesus in God's presence. Paul assures the Corinthian Christians that God has done this for their sake. God has offered them salvation from death by the grace of God's gift, the free, unmerited gift of love, mercy, and forgiveness. So because of this gift of grace demonstrated by the rising of Jesus from the dead, Paul and his companions do not lose heart. They do not wallow in despair and give in to hopelessness. They do not lose heart even though their physical bodies are injured and deteriorating with age. Paul writes that their outer nature is wasting away. And that's something many of us here are witnessing and concerned about for ourselves. But Paul tells us, he tells them that even though their bodies are declining, that their inner nature is being renewed day by day. We may be physically deteriorating, but our souls are growing stronger as we stay connected to the Holy Spirit and remain faithful to the Spirit's calling. The Apostle then encourages the people at Corinth by telling them that all the suffering and difficulties they experience in this life is but a moment in time. He says to them, life is short, so hang in there. And if they remain faithful, all their troubles will be forgotten when they receive an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. The experience of heaven, which we cannot see now, will make all our suffering and hardship pale in comparison. Paul writes that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal and in the heavens. If our physical earthly bodies weaken and fail and fall apart, do not worry, because God will give us a heavenly and eternal body. God promises that we will live on eternally with God. Now the focus of the passage seems to be encouraging the Christians at Corinth to remain faithful with their reward of heaven. Have you ever thought about heaven? Have you, have you ever tried to imagine it? Yes? Oh, okay. All of us at one time or another has wondered what heaven was like and what would be the experience if we go there. Many of our more conservative brothers and sisters in the faith seem to be more interested in avoiding the torment of punishment of hell than uh, they are about what heaven is like. More conservative Christians use the fear of hell to convince us that we want to go to heaven. Uh, it almost feels as if they get a joyful glee out of telling us of the punishment of eternal pain and suffering in hell by describing its vivid detail, lakes of fire and eternal pain, torturing souls and all of that. Well, fear can be a strong motivator for behavior. And, motivate, and avoiding pain, yes, that is something that all God's creatures would like to do. I compare this approach with getting some bad news from your doctor about your, about your condition of health. You're diagnosed with having diabetes, or, or maybe it's high blood pressure, and you are afraid of what's going to happen to you. So you start eating good foods, you start exercising, but somewhere along the way, Fear stops motivating you to continue these changes. You need a new motivator other than fear. So notice that in the second Corinthian passage, Paul does not use the fear of hell to motivate the Corinthians. He uses the reward of heaven to encourage faithfulness in the Corinthians. Now many evangelists use the reward of heaven as a motivator for people to follow Jesus. 
After uh, scaring the hell out of people, the evangelist tries to entice people with the delights of heaven. Well, there is a popular sentiment that heaven is a place of all kinds of delights. To a certain extent, in popular imagination, heaven is the place where you can indulge yourself without fear of consequences as you have on earth. You'll be able to eat all you want, never get fat. You'll always be beautiful, always be handsome. Heaven becomes, in some people's minds, a place where you can get all the things that you could not do on earth or denied yourself. But notice in that scripture passage that Paul, Paul does not mention heaven as a place of self-indulgence. The only thing he mentions is the, only, is the one thing that heaven is all about, the presence of God. Verse 14 says, and will bring us with you into God's presence. You see, the essential choice we have is not whether we want to avoid the suffering of hell or miss out on the delights and pleasures of heaven. The essential choice we have is do you want to be with God or not? Heaven is all about the presence of God. So do you want to be with God or not? We do not get to go to heaven because we did more good deeds than bad ones. We do not earn heaven. We get to go to heaven because we choose the grace of God. The good deeds we do are our thanksgiving for God giving us grace, which allows us to be in God's presence. The first letter of John tells us that God is love, and that God loves us and that we should love God in return. That is what prepares us for heaven, loving God. That is what heaven is all about, loving God. Do you want to be with God? Do you want to be in God's loving presence? That's the question. Heavenly Father, bind us together as one family, knit in the fabric of the Spirit, together as body of Christ. Amen. Today we celebrate our choirs. Our choirs give us a sense of family through familiar songs and tunes that encourage us to seek and perceive God's will in our lives. From our first lesson we heard from the very last of the judges text that should remind us of the troublesome nature of who we are as God's people. Listen to this, these two verses, 19 and 20. The people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no. We are determined to have a king over us. We are determined to be just like every one of the people that we are interacting with. We don't want to interact with God. You do it. Familiar language, familiar terms, and familiar way for the people of Israel. And from the psalm, the psalmist envisions a day when all kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord. For they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Are we there yet? No. Did we get close? Have we gotten close? Have we ever gotten close? No. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> the reality is we are humans, and we want shortcuts we do not want the personal or corporate sacrifices, and we look for the easy solution that doesn't pain us or get us into conflict with one another. And if you're having trouble with what I just said, now hear the words from the gospel. Because at start of that gospel reading that Juanita read for us is his family, and it ends with his family. And the family doesn't come out looking too good. And yet, Jesus does not dispose of them. But the text tells us the crowd came together so they would not eat 
And when his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying he has gone out of his mind. Now they are not saying this, the people are, and they are embarrassed about Jesus. Have you ever been accused of being embarrassed for your faith, your life of faith, your life in Christ? Have you ever been accused that, you know, you've got to tone it down just a bit, Pastor Bob. You've got to get with the society and culture. Because at the end of the text, it says Jesus replies to them, Who's my mother? Who's my brothers? It's a rhetorical question because he replies to them as he sits down teaching in the rabbinical style to all of them, the troubled souls, the sinners, the ones that are having difficulty with his own message and his, his own family. Here is my mother and my brothers and my sisters. Those who do the word, those who do the will of God, they are my family. So you should come out of this text with a question. What is the will of God and how do we belong to that family? Now if you're a lifelong congregationalist, you should stand firm in that understanding in fact that as congregationalists we have defined and redefined and revisited every aspect of social justice for human existence, standing in the trenches and in the margins for people who are oppressed, marginalized, and ostracized. It is clear from the text that Jesus creates a brand new family in his language, one that includes the disciples, ourselves, and mostly everyone who gets the whole message wrong. A crowd of misfits, crazies, his embarrassed family, his relentlessly undiscerning disciples, and let's not forget the accusing scribes and Pharisees who accuse him of being possessed. It is far too easy for us to remain comfortable with a Jesus whose family values align with our own and doesn't push the margins or expose the margins or open us up to the fray. But this narrative demands for a different perspective because it is these very people that are condemned for failing to recognize who Jesus is that Jesus came for. It becomes most disturbing to understand that the authorities to which Jesus is filled with, that the authority to which Jesus is filled with is mistakenly identified as the powers of the enemy. They can't recognize the Spirit of God working in, with, and through Jesus any better than the Spirit of Beelzebub. It is this mistaken identity that sets the two on a collision course that ends up with his death. It is an odd feature that Jesus' ministry is proclaimed that he is open to everybody, Gentiles, Jews, the poor, the demented, the sick, the working class, women, tax collectors, sexual outcasts. The only people who provoke Jesus' intolerance are his own family because they are embarrassed and they don't see him conforming to the norm of the law-abiding scribes. The ones closest to him, his family, and those who are like him, dedicated to a life of piety, see him as the farthest away from where they are, unable to bridge that chasm, unable to yield, surrender. They are least able to make that leap from the dedication to a religion that is defined in legalism to one of open-heartedness and love of God's beloved for the disfigured humanity that exists then and now. For these people, Jesus' disordered love of humanity feels like falling off a cliff into chaos, best symbolized by the demonic or insanity. How is that any different than what we're experiencing today in our own society, with a society that has been legally allowed to separate women and children because they're illegal aliens and place them far away from each other? without the benefit 
of compassion, care, comfort. How are we any different than them? For those of you that know your pilgrim history, you should be proud of the fact that we were a people inspired by the principle of religious freedoms, that pilgrims and Puritans traveled to this land to establish what we now know as our own churches. They founded the nation's first public schools. The oldest continuously operated public school system in America was founded in 1635. Prevented by King James from publishing any sort of materials, the pilgrims brought with them their own printing press. And the New World saw the birth of the first book printed here, the Bay Psalms book in 1640. Early New, Cong New England Congregationalists began founding colleges, Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, Oberlin, Elmhurst, Pomona, and Rollins across the frontier and moving westward. Congregationalists op opposition to slavery began in 1700 with, when Puritan Samuel Sewell, Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Superior Court, wrote the first anti-slavery tract published in America. 1773, Congregationalist Phyllis Wheatley was the first black woman whose writings, poetry, were published. 1785, Reverend Lemuel Haynes was the first African American ordained to Christian ministry in a mainline, congregation, in a mainline Protestant tradition. In 1806, five Williams College graduates felt a calling to dedicate their lives to foreign mission. Oberlin College was founded by Congregationalists in 1833. 1839, it was our forebears in southern New England who rallied for the freedom of the African captives from the La Amistad. 1845, Philip Schaff scandalizes the Reformed churches in Pennsylvania when he argues for a Protestant Catholicism centered in the person of Jesus Christ. And the movement founded by Schaff and his friend John Nevin revived sacramental worship in the Reformed Church. 1846, the Amistad case is a spur to the consciousness of Congregationalists who believe no human being should be a slave. After the Civil War, the American Missionary Association works with freed American slaves, now Africans, to found hundreds of schools and colleges and churches all over the South to educate freed slaves and their children. These higher institutions are known now as Fisk, Talladega, Beria, Hampton, Atlanta, Howard. 1853, Antoinette Brown is ordained as a minister, the first American woman to be ordained into Christian ministry. 1897, the social gospel is proclaimed as a national movement. 1952, evangelical and reformed theologian Paul Tillich pu publishes his work titled The Courage to Be. Life demands again and again change and to be reflective to that change. And that's where our shared path and journey separates. Because out of that experience that was born as the congregational expression here in America, the UCC was born. So in 1964, the executive officer of the UCC petitions the FCC to challenge the rules and regulation that prohibit black people from owning licensed airwaves. The United Church of Christ becomes the first denomination to openly ordain, to ordain an openly gay person in San Francisco in 1972. UCC ordains a minister and national staff person on the Commission of Racial Justice. 1987, the General Synod votes to declare that Christianity does not supersede Judaism and that God's covenant with the Jewish people has not been rescinded, abrogated, or overwritten. Continuing with the legacy that began in 1700s, in 1989, the UCC becomes the first denomination in the Christian tradition to name racism as a sin. In 2005, meeting in Atlanta, the Generalist Synod of the UCC becomes the first denomination to affirm equal marriage rights by an overwhelming vote. 2014, the UCC files the landmark suit against North Carolina challenging marriage laws. 
and the right to exercise free speech. In 2014, the UCC also became the first religious denomination to be a major sponsor of the gay games in Cleveland. We stand once again as we watch the unfolding of what is legal verse against families in our nation who come here illegally and then are separated children from women, women from men. And we do this as Congregationalists with a vein of social justice that invites us to challenge our government not so much to follow the rule of law but to do what is just. What is God's justice? Where does God demand us to be on this? And how do we reconcile ourselves when we remain mute? Look who is on the outside at the end of this gospel. This text ends where it began with Jesus' family. His mother, his father, his mother, his brothers are outside calling on him. Calling on him to retreat from whatever position is being heard on the inside. Do not make an embarrassment of yourself. Do not go down the path where you will be cru crucified. Jesus responds with a question that he himself answers. Whoever does the will of God is my family. Insiders and outsiders are now defined not by blood, but by a commitment to doing God's will. As congregationalists, we have lived and walked and journeyed that will our entire life. Today is no different. Today is just another milestone in the journey that we are asked to walk and journey together. Meanwhile, the tension between the proclamation of God's inclusive love and the natural human, the church, proclivity to define outsiders and insiders persists. You are invited to seek the spirit on your own, in our community, and in the community that we serve by nourishing and nurturing them to find a peaceful resolve to what is happening and unfolding before us. In the living name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.